Okay, so today's uh, topic is post-humanism. And um, this is a lecture, unlike last class where we talked about transhumanism, which isn't really a lit theory thing. There isn't a great deal of literary theory on transhumanism, although you could see cyborg feminism. Uh, Donna Haraway wrote a, uh, an essay called Cyborg Feminism about ways of reconceiving the female in the light of the idea of a constructed identity. And you certainly can see transhumanism, cap so a capital H plus is their way of enhancing the human uh, in, in gender identity as well. It's a way of reconceiving or uh, modifying or improving or enhancing what's already there. So uh, that is, I think, there in literary theory, it's hugely influential if you think about the gender, transgender movement, transgenderism and transhumanism go sort of hand in glove, I think. Um, but uh, it's not, as a literary theory, it's not that present uh, in the way that posthumanism is. And so today's lecture is, I think, far more important and more consequential. And I think at the end of it, you're going to see uh, quite how important it is. But I'll say what I said last time about transhumanism, uh, which is that nobody in the conservative community is even talking about it as a problem, uh, let alone Christians who think that everything techno technological is neutral and it just depends on how you use it so it's okay as if technology doesn't change us, as well as us uh, changing other things by it. Although it's obvious that uh, everything can become uh, uh, a, an object of idolatry, and, and screens most certainly are. Um, and it says in scripture, we become what we worship for good or for ill. Um, but transhumanism is, is briefly the augmentation of what's already there, what we call the, the human, the humanum. Uh, it, it thinks that there is such a thing as, as human nature, and it seeks to augment it, and it largely does it in ways that are enhancements through genetics, um, through uh, re reproductive technologies, um, through nanotechnologies, all, ma all manners of ways of enhancing the human. Um, and the, the aim then is to extend human life almost infinitely. And a good way of seeing this for those of us who have read a little bit of literature is in the figure of uh, Dr. Weston in the sci-fi novels of C.S. Lewis. In the first novel, Weston is a transhumanist. He wants to extend human life everywhere. And that's why he's interested in interplanetary travel. He wants to go to other planets and spread humanity everywhere. So he sees a good in human nature uh, and he wants to perpetuate it and spread it out everywhere. And, um, and is willing to do anything to do that, including uh, kill off other life, life. And that doesn't matter to him at all. He has no qualms about it. He's also willing to sacrifice individual human lives to do it. And that includes the figure of Elwin Ransom at the beginning and others. And he's willing to do experiments on individuals and individuals doesn't matter. And Ransom uh, defends the traditional view of human nature against Ransom's transhumanism, saying that actually he does think it matters what you do to an individual and that an individual is effectively of infinite worth and we can't actually measure how terrible this is even if it's only one. And so the good of the many don't outweigh the good of the one because every human being bears the image of God. It's, it's implicit in Ransom's defense there. In the second version of that trilogy, Paralandra, we meet a different Weston he has changed from his previous position and he adopts something that I'm going to call post-humanism. 
And uh, I'm going to dig down on it a little bit, but I think uh, exploring it through the literature is a helpful way of seeing the twin aspects of a uh, of a, a way of engaging with humanism that are both practiced in our day, but seldom get acknowledged as problems or threats. Although the problem of transhumanism, as I say, comes right out of the eugenics movement, and eugenics is acknowledged as a war crime after the first after the Second World War, although it continues on apace, and is it is uh, inextricably linked actually with the abortion movement which itself will stop human propagation. And interestingly, Margaret Sanger says that one of the chief aims of the um, Planned Parenthood is to get women to give to bear children later in life. So we have to find a way for women to have children later and to get them into the workforce, etc., so that there are few, fewer human beings. She's not just interested in particular types of human beings, although she, she is most certainly a race as she puts these Planned Parenthood clinics in the midst of ghettos and so forth. And you, you can uh, look it up for her comments on uh, African Americans and other uh, races as she defines them. Um, but she's interested in the uh, reduction of human, the human species in general. And the way that you do this is you delay women's uh, years of, of reproductive uh, possibility. So you keep the, the age of marriage later, if you have it at all, and of, have, of bearing children well later. And we can see the effect of that already. The success of that movement is the fact that in major cities, women are not bearing children until their late 30s or even their 40s. And then, then they have to use assisted reproductive technologies to help them to do that often. It's very common in our day. So transhumanism seeks to augment the human, seeing the human as something that they are and that deserves to be perfected and to some degree extended given eternal life. And that's what Weston is after. And in general, we can see that movement in our day in Silicon Valley through various means. And there are various means of doing so. Post-humanism, works hand in glove with it, but it's, it's, it's more, a more radical version of it. Post-humanism disputes, and I've talked thus far on the course of various forms of isms that animate the discourse of the uh, progressives in the academy. The anti-Christian, atheist, humanists in the academy, largely Darwinian in their viewpoint. It's, actually, Darwinism is taught as a fact in biology 101 in every university. You begin with that. You, you have to start with the assumption that this is a true way of things, not a theory, it is, this is the way it is. You, that's the way they start. But we've seen all sorts of isms that arise in the academy with respect to literary theory thus far. Feminism will um, be against sexism. Um, Post-colonialism will be against uh, nativism or, or um, Eurocentrism. Um, the um, queer, queer theory movement will be against um, the idea of um, homonormativity. But they'll in general be attacks on particular types of isms that they think are objectionable. And they want to come at it from the binary opposite perspective. Again, according to the structuralist idea that um, the way in which human beings think and categorize is in, ter is in terms of opposites. So a male and a female are opposites and one of them has the power. And the one that has the power is the male and therefore it, the feminist wants to assert the female against the male and to, to some extent, replace the male, to do justice, to rectify the wrongs of that. L likewise, in uh, queer theory. Heteronormativity ne needs to be removed as the norm and we need to establish something along the lines of homonormativity. Um, same thing in Chicano studies and in native studies and in um, critical race theories, etc. There's a, there's a binary that is assumed to be the real problem that needs to be deconstructed. 
and then replaced, because it's not just about a conceptual category, replaced in terms of the power dynamics that ensue as a result of these false binaries that have, we've allowed to establish to themselves in our culture. So those movements have been underway. But a broader movement, and which is, I think, crept under the radar, although it is all around us, is the chiefism that uh, they are opposed to. Anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism. The idea that human culture, uh, human knowledge, the organization of human knowledge, human government, uh, a human way of engaging with nature is inherently anthropocentric and this is a problem because it's subject to the attack, the, the problem that they call of, and this is a, a phrase that will be used, speciesism. We privilege the species of humankind over the other kinds of entities on earth. We privilege that. We assume, we just assume, we don't even argue for it, we assume that that a man, that humanity is a of a different category and of a superior category and of a, uh, therefore, of a ruling category over the other forms of um, things that we encounter in life. Because I, I, I could say other animals, but actually it extends the, anthrop the anthropocentric critic, criticism rather, um, extends over all forms of life. And it's going to attack the very idea that the human, uh, that we have a human nature distinct from other natures, and is going to try and include the perspectives of non-anthropic things not just animals and creatures, but also water and air, vegetative matter, and even uh, technology. So this uh, little image I have behind me, the post-human, this is a book from a very influential post-humanist theory by the name of uh, Rosa Braidotti. She spoke here at the University of Toronto a few years back is a way of addressing, and, and, and I like the picture, it's very um, symbolic of the post-human perspective. We can see here at the center a, 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 an homage, as it were, to da Vinci, right? With the Vitruvian man, Vitruvian man, with his, and this is a drawing from Leonardo da Vinci, and we have something along the lines of, of uh, a perfect man here, representing all sorts of things. It's a very interesting study in what he's trying to do in this picture. But you see a circle around him and a square, and there's, and there's certain perfections here. He is male as well. Uh, whereas the post-human, we have clearly a female, and we have a great deal of technology here to some degree. And we also have the influence of something like water. Water is a very important aspect of post-humanism uh, in keeping with uh, an idea that um, I've even heard them cite, the Chinese idea of Tao. Tao, in the chapter four of the Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching, I can't pronounce, Tao is variously signified with three different qualities and three stages of realization. Whirlpool, abyss, and still. And they all come from the same semantic particle, meaning water. So this is a way in which post-humanists like to conceive themselves because of course water is a constantly moving, it has I guess the three phases if you will, of a whirlpool, an abyss, and a still. You can encounter water in those three ways. I, I would say that you can encounter it even further by freezing it evaporating it and leaving it as it is but it's a malleable thing it's necessary for life it's part of all life pretty much 
our body is composed of what, 90% water? I can't remember what they say. 70%, okay. Significant portion of water. If you don't eat for a few days, actually you'll be healthier. If you don't drink for a few days, you may die, depending on your, the climate. If it's hot and you're sweating you're, and you don't have water for, your, for a few days, you're probably not gonna live. Uh, in any context, water is a far greater necessity than food in terms of urgency. Jesus uh, is in the wilderness for 40 days without food, um, entirely possible. Does he have water? I doesn't say anything about it, does he? Doesn't he eat? Does he have water? I don't. I'm not sure. Not sure he can be in the desert for 40 days without water. He doesn't eat. Um, the post-human is, uh, I'm gonna to come to a definition in a minute. In fact, I'll need to do that. In fact, why don't I do it right now? This is a, something I gave to you on our, our uh, the little uh, hyperlink I gave you before the class. Just to give a general gist of it, it's such a large topic that you've not heard of that I didn't want to uh, read one particular thinker, but rather give you a definition and then talk about the various different directions in which we can see manifestation of post-humanism all around us. Because it is the most potent theory of our day. And I'll give you the definition, then I'm going to go to C.S. Lewis's little book, Paralandra, and look at the evolution of Weston as a post-human in his convictions. But here's the definition. It's not much of a definition. It's more of a descriptive phrase of all the things because post-humanism is more of a way of being. It a, has a religious quality to it that transhumanism does as well, but it's, a, po it, it, it's a, a way of living that is more in keeping with Eastern philosophies than Western ones. And the reason why I say that is Western philosophies, Western theologies are based on monotheism personhood that, that that that's there now the idea of whether it's in islam where there's god they have allah or it's trinitarian theology of christianity where we have the three persons of the divinity or whether it's judaism which i think um, is also probably implicitly trinitarian i would argue it is but even not the acknowledge that there is God and that we bear his image, that's implicit in the Genesis text, or actually it's explicit in the Genesis text, uh, moves to an idea that there is something about God, and God is even described in Scripture as, although he says that he's not a man or like a man, nonetheless he's described as having eyes, he can see, he can hear, he has an arm, etc. These are, um, in terms of language theologians will say this is accommodationalist language god isn't actually a man he doesn't have parts like we do this is it, we need to understand this is just accommodationalist language nonetheless the accommodation is there and we understand god in roughly human terms because of this and and again christians will regard scripture as revelation so it has authority to it it's not just a, a perspectival thing the accommodationist language but post-humanism, on the other hand, is a mode of thinking about the intersecting human, non-human, and technological worlds. Note all those things. That has gained theoretical currency in the late 20th and 21st centuries, especially in the wake of ecological consciousness and environmental campaigns that call into question the role of humans in shaping the fate of the earth. The interconnectedness of humans with the other life forms in the planet has been common place in Asian, African, and Aboriginal thought as embodied in Yoruba. What is Yoruba? The subcontinents, tribal myths, folklore, creation stories of the Native Americans and literatures from these continents. Post-humanism as a school of theory in the West draws on a Eurocentric tradition of humanism and its critique. So the post-humanism does not originate in Asia or Africa or in Aboriginal thought. It comes directly from the West and its critical tradition about humanism. All of which I, I would say takes on a particular flavor come the, and I'm gonna repeat myself, the, the early 18th century 
and the study of human language that begins there and the evolutionary theories that eventually get a biological expression that arise in the 19th century. And they get, then get particular uh, energy when, as Lewis says, the idea of the machine takes hold over the Western imagination and we start applying the uh, Baconian idea of power over nature to human beings. And the, we have the so-called Geisteswissenschaft and the social sciences. We have anthropology, we have sociology, we have psychology. We have all sorts of studies of human beings from a scientific perspective. Trying to gain power over our own nature by understanding it from our own perspective. All the while begging the question of what it is we're actually studying. What is a human being? They just put that question on hold. And I've described it in my, my book as a crisis of the human sciences because it is an answer that they require to begin the investigation and yet they, they're in the process of solving it because they're, it's always in process and there'll never be an answer. There's no subject, there's no object. The object actually is, is the same as the subject and yet they regard it as still as a quasi-scientific endeavor and it's been in, again, it's been entrenched in universities for a few hundred years now and is the dominant view that will be presented to you in the secular universities. Even though it is, I would say, philosophically bankrupt, conceptually incoherent, impossible. You cannot be the object of your own experiment in a scientific sense. Whatever it is about human humanity, which is distinct to humanity, namely the capacity that they can think, they can reason, is not there with, uh, in other forms of life, and therefore is something distinct to human nature. But reason is a capacity, it's not something that can be observed even. So where do we get this capacity for reasoning? Well, they say it comes, you know, again, the Darwinians will say we evolved to achieve reason out of, out of non-reasoning material essences. And I'd say, well, how is that possible then? Explain to me the mechanism whereby something that does not exist at all, in, even in a nascent form, suddenly pops into existence. It just, it's incoherent. It was all, before I was a Christian, I thought this is the craziest, stupid theory. Anyway, but post-humanism as a school of theory in the West draws on a Eurocentric tradition of humanism and its critique, some of which emerges from critical race theory, which we looked at, and disciplines as diverse as animal studies and social studies of technology. Euro-American post-humanism calls for a re-evaluation of traditional humanistic myths, such as the human as the center of the universe. Or the instrumental attitude toward, the, toward other life forms and non-living matter. A contribution of post-humanist thought has been to decenter the human and to demonstrate how all matter is interlinked. All matter is in interlinked. Note the phrase. Matter. Mutually dependent and co-evolved, whether this is the animal forms on earth or the impact humans have, have on technology and vice versa. Gender, sexuality, and social relations and families and communities have all been reconfigured through the arrival and incorporation of technology. Post-humanism demolishes the nature-culture binary. As it has been enshrined in the Euro-American tradition. They never mention scripture. They never mention Christianity because they're afraid of it, quite frankly. They don't know it, they don't engage with it. They talk about it as if the history of Western thought began in the 18th century in the Enlightenment when we started studying ourselves and in which there was a concept of nature and culture. And it was attempt, there was an attempt made to establish culture based on an inherited cultural mandate which they got from Genesis, yet without any sense that uh, we are dominion over the creatures of the earth, the air, the water, are under God's dominion. 
So it's a limited dominion, it's stewardship. Not in the Enlightenment, it's not. In the Enlightenment, it's domination, it's, it's for the purposes of power. This is a significant shift that comes with the Enlightenment, which they then attribute to Christianity. Christianity is domineering, it's about rationalism, rationalism is about gaining power over things. It is post-Enlightenment, it's not pre-Enlightenment. Christians live in the midst of this great transformation, cultural shift that overcomes the Western University. And now we get in post-humanism a critique of that and the implicit views that they say undergird the whole Enlightenment project. So rather than questioning the whole Enlightenment project and the vantage point taken within that Enlightenment project, which I have sketched out now since last semester when I looked at this study of language in its early origins in the 18th century and then the Geisteswissenschaften that are built out based on it, rather than questioning that and seeing human personhood as a significant feature of human nature, they decide that they're going to address the Enlightenment as if it were a feature of Christianity and a necessary one, and in fact, a, an improvement upon it. And they're going to extend the Enlightenment then. And what's more Enlightenment now is a more spiritual view of nature. And it, the more spiritual view of nature will have a material view, a material basis. But post-humanism demolishes the nature culture binary as it has been enshrined in the Euro-American tradition. Technologies and humans, it argues, co-evolve. You ever seen technology evolve on its own? It collapses distinctions. <laughs> and then uses language to talk and it's very vague and fuzzy and it all serves a purpose of constructing a narrative. The narrative doesn't bear scrutiny because again, one of the binaries that they deconstruct is that of logic. They, they dispute the laws of logic. We've already talked about this. The law of non-contradiction does not apply because law of non-contradiction produce separations and distinctions, which if you're a post-humanist, you most certainly want to discard because you want to blur the boundary between animals and humans and humans and vegetables and humans and technology. So it's a, it's a quasi-religious philosophical movement in the academy that is actually opposed to philosophical inquiry, although the people that do it are mostly will call themselves philosophers, and is not only at war with the word, but at war with human nature. So, so, back to this. Technology and humans, it argues co-evolve just as humans and non-humans do. Which I would say beg the question, do non-humans evolve and do humans evolve? Where's the proof of this assertion? Begging the question. It, and it, what it assumes then is that the theory of evolution, not just biologically, but evolution in general, is a valid perspective. Well, if you come from the perspective of water, I guess it is. Because water changes, whether it improves, who knows. But um, It also examines the prospects of human enhancement, the expansion of artificial intelligence, and the ethics of these developments as they affect humans, the law, concepts of personhood, and the social order. So in other words, post-humanism works alongside with transhumanism. Both of them, uh, in a sense, are, are setting aside the question of whether biotechnology, as it's addressed in this book by Oliver O'Donovan, whether biotechnology ought to be used in human nature. It, transhumanists have no qualms about using it. No qualms whatsoever. And so they're implicitly post-humanist, I would argue. They're implicitly. But still, they want to win in life. They want to evolve. They want to be the survivor at the end of the Darwinian survival of the fittest chain. So they're willing to set aside the ethical questions in favor of just enhancement. But they will work together against the 
personhood tradition of Christendom and the logocentrism of Christendom, which are inextricably linked because Christ is the logos of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So popular culture. So how does it come? It does come through the academy, but it also comes through propaganda. Popular culture, performance arts, and even architectural styles have been known to incorporate post-human themes. Popular culture in particular has made cyborgs, chimeras, human-animal hybrids, and techno-dystopias dwelling on rampaging artificial intelligence and cyborgs, usually a commonplace motif. It's all around us in pop culture. Even in the superheroes of the Marvel universe. These are technologically enhanced human beings. How it happens, improbable accidents. I mean, if you're a billionaire, you can, like Tony Stark, you can become Iron Man or, or Batman, same, you, gotta, you either have to have a lot of money or you have to have some improbable accent that gives you enhanced capacities. And they're all very different. And sometimes they team up and so forth. But it's, this is a softening of the ground of human nature and it's something that we are being, I would say, orchestrated to support and dream about and desire to become as gods. But becoming as gods is no longer a personal thing because the concept of God in the Western tradition is personal and related to human nature and the God here that is in view is not God per se but rather spirit. And so spirituality comes in, the, in, in place of religious belief in a theologically specific, articulatable, rational way of engaging with life. And it's, and it's a lifestyle as much as anything. The post-humanists have a lifestyle. And so, and so finally, post-humanist thought treats veg, an, animals and plants as companion species to animals, and numerous studies now explore vegetal thinking animality and the entanglements of humans with other life forms as well as non-living matter as well as non-living matter more recent work in posthumanism and the fiction of j and k jemison and others see seeks to link race in history with a particular history of particular practices that dehumanize humans such as colonialism and slavery introducing race into the debate when speaking of, say, the Anthropocene or technology enables a provincializing of post-humanism. That's a, that was all a big, very, very big mouthful, to put it mildly. It's a difficult thing to define, but in, in brief, transhumanism believes there is such a thing as human nature and seeks to augment it and perfect it. Post-humanism <coughs> denies that the category of the human even is even exists. And we've been basing our actions on the presupposition that there is such a thing as human nature, which ironically, my thesis uh, that uh, the human sciences have the problem of not defining human nature demonstrates. But it's not a problem for Christians, it's a problem for the Enlightenment, it's a problem for these characters, the post-humanists. They're, they're right, they are begging the question. At the heart of their endeavor is the death of the author. They proclaim the death of God, yes, and the death of the author, that is humanity, comes along with it. Because we bear God's image, so it's a downstream effect of this, and they are correct in it. But are they correct in the very uh, calibration of Western thought towards our explanation of who we are and our study of who we are without appeal to Christian theology? And I think there they err enormously. You know what? Comment or question, please no, do before I go. Just, I, I'm wondering, like, how to uh, call out something as posthumanist when something when the discussion is so uh, vast. Uh, for example, uh, there are certain people who are, uh, uh, let's say, they don't uh, agree with uh, the killing of animals, like you know, in certain Indian religions. But at the same time, there are many people who aren't like that, but they. Uh, for other reasons, they support uh, biotechnology, let's say, or they support AI, or they support uh, discussions about whether uh, technology could one day become sentient, or they support, uh, like, but, so there's, but like, but they don't fit all of the categories because there's also an anthropocentrism, or like, how would you, like, 
it's hard to something is, yeah. this is why i say that they're sort of twins yeah because the yeah. transhumanists even when they say they augment the human it still begs the question because they don't know what the human is mm -hmm. what are they augmenting and it might actually just be their memories their minds in which case your mind can be assimilated into the borg and you, you you can exist you know again they use the star trek next generation the borg is going to assimilate everything that is unique about you into the collective that's sort of a transhumanist thing there's something unique in you but what is it about you in the star trek series it's not a physical human person it's your thoughts your memories your feelings whatever it will be pulled in that's still transhumanism and it, just think of the figure that speaks on behalf of the borg this cyber woman effectively right that's how she presents uh, itself in the sci-fi it's it, so transhumanism to, to some degree collapses into post-humanism already because even transhumanism begs the question of what the human is that they're modifying. They just simply assume it. They tend to be practitioners, the transhumanists, and not really bothered about the question of, well, is it coherent? Do we actually know who we are? And before we proceed, can we at least understand what we're talking about? Now, let's not, let's, let's, get going and then we'll figure that question out afterwards <laughs> which is disastrous ethical consequences that's i send the legacy of uh nazi germany interestingly oh by the way i have all sorts of books today uh the drama of atheist humanism i've talked about a few times it talks uh, about ninth the 19th century nietzsche Kant, marx and feuerbach chiefly by a uh ressourcement theologian henri de lubac uh good easy reading i think well I found it easy, um, as in coherent and so forth. Uh, this book also, also well, The Invention of Nature by Andrea Wolf, Alexander von Humboldt's New World, talking about him as a uh, Humboldt whose brother established the University of Berlin, uh, where they abolished theology. He's going out and establ establishing our concept of nature. I've talked about that with you a few times, the romantic view of nature as a quasi-divine thing uh, to which we are to some degree indistinguishable, uh, presented in romantic poetry. Wordsworth regularly appeals to nature and the return to nature as a way of renovating himself and sees himself in the air, in the water, in the trees, and in the mind of man and all of those things. There's something spiritual, so it's a spiritualizing of human nature and it's to some degree a disintegration of personhood. Shelley does the same thing. It's the main romantic thrust, really, is it pushes towards pantheism or panentheism more specifically, the unity of hum the human being with the natural world. So posthumanism is, is simply a technological ages uh, enhancement of romanticism. It's the premises of romanticism, romanticism now played out in the light of the threats to humanity that emerged in the 20th century. So in, the, so in the third quarter of the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche um, really maybe starts the charge, and I'd say Nietzsche does, and Feuerbach does, and... and uh, and Comte does with his positivism. Um, they really are trying to subvert the rationalist ideal of, of knowledge. And specifically the idea that there are, that there is a, an analog, analogy between our capacities and God that allows us to understand the world around us. Nietzsche uh, will be, at least according to the post-structuralist Gilles Deleuze, not mentioned Deleuze yet, and I could, but there's just so many characters. Uh, Deleuze says that Nietzsche was the first to refute the rationalist tradition and open up the possibility for different ways of thinking. I don't think he's correct. I think we can see exactly the same thing in Marx and Feuerbach and Hegel, uh, but anyway, but Nietzsche does 
introduced the problems of it. And it's, it's uh, his proposal of the idea of the ubermensch, which sets humanity up with the idea of transcending itself, is probably there uh, and the reason that he says this. But, but, but Marxism is already an attack on rationality, and you could even add, um, if you want, Darwin to that as well. Although Darwin isn't really a philosopher, but if evolutionary theory, the appeal to a material uh, origin and so forth is already an attack on rationalism. It just is. Um, and Foucault will build on this and, and Nietzsche's, and add that Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God uh, will go on to proclaim the death of man. So this is a project that uh, is long standing. And as I said to you, when we studied Foucault and queer theory, Foucault insisted that man is only a recent invention and one perhaps nearing its end. Quote, man is only a recent invention and perhaps one perhaps nearing its end. It's be when does it begin? He sees it in the human sciences project. And then he talks about that as a epistemes, right? These are different different types of knowledge. And there's a type of knowledge in episteme that emerges in the 19th century, which he thinks is particularly problematic. And so he will try and subvert the power structures, which he says are latent in, in the whole project. Um, well, post-humanism is going to be animated by all of these thinkers, the whole atheist humanist tradition, which I think is rooted in romantic ideas and evolutionary ideas and materialistic ideas and panentheist ideas, which you can also find in Spinoza in the 18th century. Well, Spinoza is a pantheist. The most important thinker that we never read about in the 18th century, that he's ignored in Western philosophy, studies, at least here in uh, North America and in England for the most part, I would say. So the Anglosphere ignores Spinoza. Uh, we tend to study Hume and, and Kant and so forth. We totally ignore Spinoza, but Spinoza is a significant figure precisely because he is the, for, he's the intellectual uh, forebear of the Romantics. Um, but post-humanism is best seen, I, I, I'm trying to find ways to come in and explain it, and I, I think literature is the best way to do it. <clears throat> There's this excerpt from the work Paralandra, and I'm gonna, so Paralandra, and it's chapter seven, and I'm gonna read extracts from it, and just chart the course. So, for those of you who haven't seen, haven't read Out of the Silent Planet, Weston captures Elwyn Ransom at the beginning of Out of the Silent Planet and takes him to a planet called Malachander, which is Mars. And there he finds various species. And, and Ransom assumes that the view of evolution and the battle of the different species for supremacy is going to hold true on Malachandra just like it did on his earth. So he's implicitly a Darwinist evolutionist in his thinking. He thinks that. And, and so when he comes to Malachandra and he sees three different species of different sorts, and in fact, different uh, types of creatures. One seems a lot like the scientists. One seems like the fabricators. And one seems like the poets. So there's the Sorns that are the scientists, philosophers. There are, are the Fiffeltrigi, which are the artisans, and they are, or the engineers, and they make things, and they're brilliant at making things. And then there's the, the Hrosa, which are fascinated and very gifted with languages, and they tell great tales and they're so forth. And he sees these three, and he assumes that the Sorns have evolved from the uh, Hrosa because the poets and the theologians gave way to the scientists in the whole, so the, the story of anthropology presents this sort of evolution, right? As things go on, we move from the 
poetic age, to the theological age, to the philosophical age, to the scientific age. And he assumes that that will be the case here, and so they must be hostile towards one another, and he finds actually they collaborate together. And uh, Weston, who doesn't even see anything but non-human beings there and is willing to kill them all, um, uh, is presented as a great villain and can't really converse with them, but, but um, what's his name? Um, uh, Ransom, Elwin Ransom, who's a sort of a C.S. Lewis figure, or actually he's a Tolkien figure, um, learns their language and learns just something about their history, which is a very different account than he's ever been given. But he defends the idea of the importance of the individual. And the individual now will not only apply to human beings, but will apply to all rational beings. And the Sorns, the Hrasa, and the Fifil Tree also bear, that have this capacity for rational thought. And so in some sense, bear the image of Mal Eldil, who's also a rational being, and also all the other spiritual beings there. But... He's defeated there, he's sort of rebuked, he goes back to Earth, Weston, as does Ransom, and now we have part two, Paralander, which is on planet Venus. And here's the two encountering one another for the first time, as I say, chapter seven, and this is Weston speaking, the scientist, transhumanist, a eugenicist, the man willing to kill others in the name of survival of the fittest. The tragedy of my life, he said, and indeed of the modern intellectual world in general is the rigid specialization of knowledge entailed by the growing complexity of it, of what is known. It is my own share in that tragedy that an early devotion to physics has prevented me from paying any proper attention to biology until I reached the 50s. To do myself justice, the 50s are the 1950s. To do myself justice, I, I should make it clear that the false humanist ideal of knowledge as an end in itself never appealed to me. I always wanted to know in order to achieve utility. You want to make it practical. This is why uh, Divine, who's the financier, is willing to work with him. Here's a man who's willing to put his science into practice and evolution where, where we can monetize this. At first, that utility naturally appeared to me in a personal form. I wanted scholarships and income and that generally recognized position in the world without which a man has no leverage. When those were attained, I began to look further to the utility of the human race, for which he was praised, actually, in the first book. He at least sees something good that he's fighting for, and that could be reformed. There's something in you that is still good, whereas, whereas divine is so contemptible that he just wants gold. And, you know, the, Ross, the uh, um, governor of Malacandra said, I just unmake you all together. Just, if you were my creature, I'd just destroy you. But you, I would reform. Because at least you want something good and you love your own kind. That's important. He pauses around a period and he says, and let's get over that bit. And let me move on to the next section. I want to read where did I put my book. Oh, it's right in front of me. In particular, I reflected on the objections you, Ransom, had felt to the liquidation of the non-human inhabitants of Malacander, which was, of course, a necessary preliminary to its occupation by our own species, speciesism, which was the transhumanist project. We can kill off everything that stands in our way because really what we want is to proliferate and extend our own human race ad infinitum. The traditional, and if I may so, the, say, so the humanitarian form in which you advanced those objections had till then concealed from me their true strength. That strength I now began to perceive. I began to see that my own exclusive devotion to human utility was really based on an unconscious dualism. Now he sounds like a post-humanist. What do you mean? I mean that all my life I'd been making a wholly unscientific dichotomy or antithesis between man and nature. Had conceived myself fighting for man against his non-human environment. And of course, this is the scientific project, it's domination over nature. And nature is seen as something that is separate from us. You're not yet a romantic. 
during my illness, I plunged into biology and particularly into what may be called biological philosophy. Hitherto, as a physicist, I've been content to regard life as a, a subject outside my scope. The conflicting views of those who draw a sharp line between the organic and the inorganic, note the, this with post-humanism, and those who held what we, we call life was inherent in matter from the very beginning had not interested in me, now it did. It, I saw almost at once that I could admit no break, no discontinuity in the unfolding of the cosmic process. I became a convinced believer in emergent evolution. All is one. The stuff of mind, the unconsciously purposive dynamism is present from the very beginning. It's all life. Here we have David Suzuki in front of us. Pretty much. It's the, it's the philosophy here of, of this scientist. Here he paused. Ransom had heard this sort of thing pretty often before. He's a humanities scholar. And wondered when his companion was coming to the point. <laughs> when Weston resumed, it was in the even deeper solemnitone. The majestic spectacle of this blind, inarticulate purposiveness thrusting its way upward and ever upward in an endless unity of differentiated achievements towards an ever increasing complexity of organization, towards spontaneity and spirituality, swept away all my old conception of a duty to man as such. Man in himself is nothing. <coughs> I say to you quite freely, <coughs> Ransom, that I should have been wrong in liquidating the Malachandrians. It was a mere prejudice that made me prefer our own race to theirs. It was anthropocentrism that drove me. To spread spirituality, not to spread the human race, is henceforth my mission. This sets the coping stone of my career. I worked first for myself, then for science, then for humanity, but now, at last, for spirit itself. I might say, borrowing language, which you will be more familiar to you, the Holy Spirit. Why is it holy? Because he regards the Spirit as holy. Now, hold on a minute. And then they get into an argument out there, and he says, well, what do you mean by that? He says, I mean that nothing now divides you and me except, except a few outworn theological technicalities with which organized religion has unhappily allowed itself to be encrusted. But I have penetrated that crust. The meaning beneath it is as true and living as ever. If you will excuse me for putting it that, that way, the essential truth of the religious view of life finds a remarkable witness in the fact that it enabled you on Malachandra to grasp in your own mythical and imaginative fashion the truth which was hidden from me. I don't know how much, much about what, what people call the religious view of life, said Ransom, wrinkling his brow. You see, I'm a Christian, and what we mean by the Holy Ghost is not a blind, inarticulate purposiveness. Yes, but in post-humanism, it is. So what we have here is emergent evolutionism in post-humanism. And the emergent evolutionism we'll see as its opponent, not Christian theology per se, although that is actually the deliberate and intentional aim. It's an attack on the Trinity and it's an attack on the Word, which I've already traced out in the course, but really it will include all of human nature in it. Because, and, and that is what we see in contemporary post-humanism. So he'll see this as a common ground, and you will find Christians that will be on board with this. And how will it issue forth in our day? It will issue forth in environmentalism. It will issue forth in the idea that human beings produce carbon, and carbon is hostile a hostile chemical to life, even though carbon is actually what the green matter of life feeds upon. And the more carbon dioxide there is in the air, the better the plants do. Remember, people aren't cars. We don't produce carbon monoxide. We produce carbon dioxide. And, and carbon dioxide is what makes the vegetable matter of the planet proliferate, which allows the animals to eat more food and allows the animals, animals to proliferate. So to 
the suggestion that it is, it is a toxic chemical that comes from life is to be against life, and in particular those that have control over their living. Although you will see in the environmental movement even a push to eliminate cows, because they fart too much, <laughs> too much carbon dioxide and methane, which is, you know, toxic chemicals. And again, but, but what, what we know in terms of nutrition is that um, eating meat is the best form of nutrition and, and enhances human life better than anything else. And red meat has a particular potency to it uh, and, and healthy qualities. But in general, in the post-humanist movement, there's a move that is concurrent with it towards a, a, right, a ritual which is expressed in the practice of veganism. Not only will we not eat meat, we'll avoid all forms of animal products, eggs and milk as well, and we'll strictly eat vegetables, which you can't nourish yourself on, by the way, without serious enhancement, you'll be deprived of, and you become very unhealthy very quickly. But also, if you take that one step further, the plants are non, they're just matter then, like, What's the next step after that where humans can eat what plants are not allowed to eat? Well, I don't know. Well, well, really, if we're all one with, with the plants, then effectively, and the, 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 the distinction between the anthropos and the, yeah. and the vegetable is a dualism that we can dispense with, then we yeah. just stop eating out of sympathy with the planet. And so really, the anthropocentrism, which is accused here in post-humanism, post-humanism is a spiritual assault on human life altogether and on the image of God and an attempt to eradicate it. It is a death and suicide cult. I call it a cult because it, it is not amenable to reason. It rejects reason altogether as a Western construct, as a form of dualism. It will appeal to truth and falsehood, right and wrong, logical, um, proof and so forth, which is in, uh, essential to human nature, and it's not just the Enlightenment that invents the capacity for reasoning. In fact, it debases what we mean by reasoning and reduces it to a sort of just a sort of a, a process. I, I critiqued that last time. It reduces reason to just process, whereas reason has more to do with us than just process. But in the end, the aim is pure spirit. Self-thinking, self-originating activity. Now, if that doesn't sound familiar to you, you haven't been listening to me for very long, because that is exactly the ideal that the Romantics push in their heroism and has stayed the, the heroic model in Western literature ever since the Romantic period, namely the idea of an orphan and the aims of the Enlightenment. What is enlightenment, according to Mr. Immanuel Kant? Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding, autonomously, without guidance from another. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. Sapere aude, dare to know. Have courage to use your own understanding. That is the model of the Enlightenment. Think of yourself as an orphan. And you be you. Dare to know. The problem with the Enlightenment project is it assumes that the you that's doing the Enlightenment is of a particular integrity and privilege that deserves to be held on to. Post-humanism disputes that. It still wants us to think like self-interpreting orphans. Having a self-thinking, self-originating activity. We come into being, we know not how. Yes, we came from our parents through procreation, but there's something miraculous about life. We can't explain it. So it, it's always appealing back to a spontaneity and a rational coming into existence. 
which they say reasoning will not help us solve. And it now becomes spiritualized into a full-blown heresy, which whose intention is not directly an attack on God, as heresies of ages past is, but a full-blown direct attack on the creature who bears the image of God, namely man. And that is all around us. So in the 70 odd years since Lewis's sci-fi trilogy was written, the dynamic that he plays out of the threat of transhumanism and the threat of posthumanism now work together uh, and dominate the space of the academic world and the educational sphere. And uh, what we talked about last time in the abolition of man, with the assault on the Tao, the idea that we have a moral nature is, is just a preparatory ground for what comes after. To allow the conditioners to get us to condition ourselves to want what they want for us. And who are the conditioners? Well, they are a certain, you can point to villains like Bill Gates and various billionaires, but ultimately I think it is the dark spiritual powers of this world. I think it's a demonic idea. A, demon, a demonic idea which has been embraced in the academy, which they can't shake off because they don't accept reasoning. They don't accept it. And they don't accept that to be a human is to be a person. They think that a human is an evolved animal and there's nothing distinctive. The, the means of recovering this, and I'll get to this next time when we, when we come to our last class on uh, a Christian response to this, but a, a great book, which I heartily recommend to you by John Rist, What is a Person? I might've mentioned this before. Uh, I took the nice cover off because uh, it was getting wrecked, uh, but it's called What is a Person? Realities, Constructs, Illusions. He was at the University of Toronto. This was published uh, not that long ago, 2020. And in this, he constructs the legacy of personhood as it develops from the what he calls the mainline tradition, namely Plato and Aristotle, and then gets brought forward in, through the Christians, through Augustine, through uh, Boethius and Richard of St. Victor, through Aquinas and Duns Scotus. That's the mainline tradition of establishing personhood. And then it takes over and he talks about its its distortion and the problem that arise from, from Descartes. Because in Descartes, uh, God is something, uh, is a thought that we can conceive of, but not as an entity whose image we bear. We can conceive of our own thinking processes because we are doubting, and therefore we can think of, conceive of it being infinitely higher, so God becomes a noumenal category for us. So, but as he describes it, the second phase of the personhood discussion is no God, no soul. What person then? And then he talks about a movement towards disabling the person. And then finally, the uh, final solution. Talks about Heidegger, talks about Strawson, and he talks about um, various uh, movements that I have associated with posthumanism. All sorts of books out there now on posthumanism. It is there in every major research university. It's in all the Ivy League schools. It's in New York, it's at Victoria College, University of Toronto. There's post, they study post-humanism. Ro Rosa Braidotti, who I mentioned here, was a guest speaker speaking there at Victoria College, where Northrop Fry used to be for decades. Uh, we associate with the East Coast, we associate more with the West Coast, with, with the environmental movement, etc., because it really is entrenched in there. And the purpose of the environmental movement is to allow, is to reduce the efficacy of human life. It's not to enhance it. It's it's to diminish the ability for people to look after themselves. And they say, we will help you, we'll look after you. But what that means, in effect, is that you will have less you will consume less, you will move less, and you will live less, and allegedly will be happy. You know, the Klaus Schwab thing. What's the phrase he used there? 
there was some phrase. But it's, a, it's an advanced movement. It's so far advanced that all of the uh, Western European nations are fully committed to it in their carbon taxes, which are going towards that same uh, particular end. It's going to, it's going to try and uh, take away farms and move away from meat. They're producing meat, by the way, bio biologically engineered right now. No animal was behind this, just the, just the uh, genetics. They're, they're sort of producing meat. Because the, the, the meatless meat that they put on the, if you've seen it in the stores, <laughs> nobody touches it because it's <laughs> awful. But now they're going to produce real meat, but it's meat that's never come from an animal. It's just biologically engineered meat. That's coming and it's being, li it's being legalized. There. Um, anyway, the comments or questions? Yes, yes, because I'm... Cyborg feminism. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so something like that reminds me of that is like the green, uh, like lady in Carol Andrew. Like she's very sub like she's submitted to God and, and so she's like powerful in that. But the cyborg woman, as well as kind of like parallel to that, where every time there's a cyborg woman, they're very like submitted. That's one of their things. But then they're also very strong and powerful. Yeah. Is it that like in. So eco feminism is a real yeah. thing. For sure, yeah. and the power of the eco-feminine and Mother Earth. There's a lot of Gaia worship type thing, yeah. and women being, I mean, again, but that's more of the dynamic of the dualism, and we're elevating the female over the male because the male is an oppressive creature with an oppressive category and represents rationalism. And rationalism in the 18th century is associated with women, with men, and women with their feelings, right? <clears throat> and um, which is true. The Enlightenment view of men is rational and women is of basically blubbering masses of feelings. Yeah. Controlled by their bodies, men are directed by their reason and so forth. This is a really bizarre distortion of human nature that happens in the Enlightenment. And sort of the battle of the sexes really takes off in the 18th and 19th century because of the Enlightenment. And it, it, it's inability, and to some degree, it's the downstream effect of Cartesian rationalism, if human nature is not to have a body, but to have a mind, then what do we do with the different differences between the two sexes of different bodies? Well, women's bodies are very different than men's, and they are more uh, intuitive, they, uh, their feelings are more sensitive, etc. All sorts of discussion of that in Sense and sen Sensibility by Jane Austen, etc. But it's all over. Uh, that period. But again, there's an appeal to emotivism in the post-humanist uh, movement. People are really committed to it as their lifestyle. And so they have integrity in that, which I admire. I always admire integrity. Um, but I have to deplore it because it's actually the integrity lies in exterminating human species, <laughs> including themselves. They're willing to die for the cause and kill everyone else for the cause. Uh, this is slightly problematic because that's the end effect of these policies is to make life more difficult for everybody uh, in the name of, again, saving something, the planet. But it begs the question, is the planet that you're saving going to be saved if human beings are not on it to cultivate it and care for it? Because I don't think that they are. The world was created by God with man as the supervisor over it, to have dominion over it under God's authority. If you remove the supervisor of the natural order on earth, what's gonna to happen to the earth? I don't think the earth is happier for it. Anyway, uh, that's roughly speaking post-humanism, the general thrust of it. Uh, my former, my supervisor, friend, Timothy Clark, uh, writes uh, eco-criticism on the edge and speaks of the Anthropocene as a threshold concept. I have not yet spoken of the Anthropocene. Rosa Bredotti speaks of it in, in, significantly here um, and talks about all of these things that I talked about, post-humanism, post-anthropocentrism, the inhuman, but she will talk in the introduction about the Anthropocene and we'll use this 
idea of the uh, age of the Eurocentric paradigm of the man-dominated world, as in humanity-dominated way of living, and we're moving away from that. So if you're interested in this, a rather brief uh, rendering is in this book, The Post-Human by Rosa, whom I don't know personally, but. And I don't know what the significance of the, of the C-A-T, A-T-C, C-C, it looks like cat is everywhere. Is it a code name? It could be, yeah, it's some sort of code. And here we have the uh, genetic code in behind it. So again, the, 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 this is why I think the picture is great. It, it does remind us of da Vinci, but now it says the complexity of genetic coding, of female, of all these sorts of things. But here that we have the G's in there as well as the T's. I have no idea. I think it's adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, probably like the oh, DNA. Oh, you're right. That's what it is. Very good. I think you're probably right. No, that, that makes sense. Very good. So the letters that represent the genetic materials in, the, yes, good. Anyway, it's just a cursory, but, the, but there's huge money being invested in universities right now in post-humanism. Whether you want to call it environmental, eco-criticism, whatever, it's all the rage. Um, in, in every field, from the sciences to the humanities to the social sciences, it's all pushed in this direction. And it's not being talked about in conservative circles or Christian circles at all. Because it's not about theology, therefore it's not about the gospel. <clears throat> right? It's, I'm thinking, how is it not about the gospel? If Jesus is God and man, and as man, if his manhood is being assaulted in the culture, then so is his nature. Not his divine nature, but his human nature. And if his human nature is, is a problem, then you have a full-blown heretical problem. It's just one that would never been considered before romanticism came about. But it is on us, and uh, in a way that I find extraordinarily worrying. <laughs>